Well, good evening. And I hope you are feeling warm in spite of the cold weather outside. Now, I, uh, as I told you before, I was born and raised in Egypt, so my system doesn't work well with ice and snow till now. So mm -hmm. I have my defense mechanism. If you come to my room, you'll find all kinds of things when I go out. I um, have my defense mechanism against this. Um, if you can read the uh, name here for me, please. Anybody? That's the name of our guest speaker. And uh, Derek is a dear friend, and he told me recently that he is leaving Charleston, uh, moving from Charleston, and uh, I told him, but we have to have you before you leave. So he has only a few days remaining in Charleston, and he was kind enough to uh, spare this time for this class and for the other class as well. So we are really thankful that uh, we can get a share of him before he leaves. And uh, I, I wouldn't do justice to him because he is introducing him because he is a multi-talented person. He is a broadcaster, he is a technology person, he is a thinker, he is a writer, he is a singer, he is a musician, he is uh, a transhumanist uh, expert and multitudes of things. If you want to ask him any question, it is your time. He likes to interact with students, with people, so he is on, when he is on his radio program, he gets calls and he answers and responds, so feel free anytime to raise your hand and uh, talk. Uh, just uh, make sure that you get this microphone because we are taping him and taping you, so the questions would be taped as well. This is not microphone for amplification, but for recording. So, uh, would you please give him a warm welcome today? Thank you, Dr. Wabi. Uh, just a, a brief biography. I uh, started out as a radio broadcaster uh, shortly after college. Went to college at uh, Knox in Galesburg. Uh, got a degree in economics, which I haven't used in any of my stops in my career. I basically made a living by talking for the last 35 years. Uh, in broadcasting, went into sales, um, but even in the sales industry, using technology quite heavily to stay in touch with customers and uh, the home office and things like that. Um, began getting interested a few years ago in how technology is being used to spy on us. You've heard about the revelations of Edward Snowden and the National Security Agency, the NSA, and how the NSA can listen to our phone calls even when your phone is powered off. Uh, I drive a General Motors vehicle that has OnStar, even though I don't subscribe to OnStar, they can activate the microphone and listen in. Um, that led me down another path of research because it occurred to me that you know, there's really nothing that I can do about that. It, it began to occur to me that there was another aspect to the technology uh, that was more significant. There, there is a growing movement in the, predominantly in the West, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Canada, Russia, Japan, uh, but it, it is spreading worldwide and it is a uh, movement that's driven by research in genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology. Uh, it promises not just radical life extension, the ability to live many years beyond what we would normally expect, but frankly it, it promises to redefine what it means to be human altogether. In fact, taken to its logical end, it would end humanity as we know it, replace it with a new species that would become the dominant species on planet Earth. I'm not a, um, afraid of technology. I think uh, I counted this afternoon just out of curiosity. Between my wife and myself, we have about 16 or 17 different devices connected to the internet at home. iPhone, iPod, four tablets, five laptops, three desktops, two Roku boxes, three Roku boxes. And, you know, anyway, I, 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 it's, it's, it's actually kind of ridiculous. But just making the point that it, it's not that I'm afraid of technology, love gadgets, love technology, but there are some aspects, some implications, some possible consequences to this movement, which is called transhumanism, that may lead to what I call the rise of the cyber gods. We're in a period of history in which technology, the rate of change, is increasing exponentially. Um, the power of information technology, it's estimated, doubles about every year. 
Um, one expert that you'll hear about today, a gentleman named Dr. Raymond Kurzweil, believes that at the rate of technological change that humanity experienced through history up until about the last century or so, based on that rate of change over the next hundred years, from today through the end of the 21st century, we may experience the equivalent of 20,000 years of technological progress. 20,000 years of progress. That's about a thousand times greater in his estimation than what we experienced in the last hundred years. That's pretty remarkable when you think about it. A hundred years ago, here in America, we were, trans we were traveling basically the way the Amish out in Arthur do, by <coughs> carts, horses, occasionally by train if you could afford it. Communication by telegraph. The telephone had just been invented, but it was the old crank telephone. Now we're sending probes to Mars, to Pluto, beyond the reach of the solar system. We can communicate in real time on the other side of the planet for free if you use Skype or something similar. The rate of change has been incredible over the last hundred years. My mother turns 78 next month. She stopped at the VCR. The DVD baffles her. DVD player. Blu-ray, forget it. You don't even want to know what the difference between Blu-ray and DVD is. In 20 years, I'm curious to see where I'm going to hit that wall. But the technologists, the researchers, believe that this new technology, this rate of change that we're seeing, is going to inevitably lead to a change in humanity. They're looking for something they call the technological singularity. This is what uh, transhumanists are looking for, at the point at which biology and machine intelligence merge, intersect, and then with the merger of our biology with technology, our cognitive abilities enhanced thousands, millions of times. We reach a new stage in human history, human society, from which we can never return. That's the origin of the name, the singularity. The technological singularity draws its name from uh, astrophysics. If you're familiar with the concept of the black hole, you get past a certain point as you approach a black hole, whereby it's impossible to return, hence technological singularity. Once we get past a certain point with technology, we cannot go back. Uh, society, humanity, is irrevocably changed. Um, this is not something that everyone in the field agrees is a good thing. I've had the opportunity, uh, I, I produce a, a podcast that I, I've been uh, doing for about five years now where I talk to people who I think have important things to say. And uh, I've interviewed a gentleman named Dr. Hugo de Garris a couple of times. He's the author of a book called The Artelect War. Uh, that's a term that he coined. Artelect means artificial intellect. Um, he was the uh, director of the uh, Artificial Brain Lab at the Qianmen University in China for a number of years. He thinks that the development of massively intelligent machines, artelects, will become a, could lead to, lead to what he calls giga death in the 21st century. He believes that this issue, the political issue of whether or not we should create artificial intelligences, Intelligence is far greater than our own. Uh, will be the political issue of the 21st century. Uh, I'm having a bit of a hard time trying to uh, rattle people's cages. Uh, that I see as one of my life goals. I'm trying to persuade people that uh, as machines become increasingly intelligent, that eventually uh, that that issue of you know, whether humanity should allow these machines to become massively intelligent or not. I, I see that issue becoming the number one political question of our century. I see humanity splitting you know, in the 2020s into three large uh, ideological, if you like, philosophical camps uh, to the first group. Um, they're the people who want to build uh, these artelects, as I call them, you know, these, these massively intelligent machines. Well, I label them cosmists. Mm -hmm. So the ideology is cosmism. Um, they, they look on human beings, we're, we're just nothing, right? We're our pathetic little human lives snuffed out in a mere 80 years in a universe snuffed that's out. billions of years old. So the, the cosmists, their, their main dream is to effectively to build gods. And that is one of the key points to take away from this discussion today. What we're talking about with transhumanism is not just radical life extension but in the minds of some, and some of the most influential in this movement, it is to build gods, to become as gods, to achieve apotheosis. 
in effect, the transhumanist movement is becoming a new religion. And as future technologists, this is something you need to be aware of as you move into these fields and begin to work. Um, the question, of course, right off the bat, is whether these people who believe that this is a desirable goal have the means to get there. Can they actually achieve what they set out to do? There are some very well-funded and uh, very intelligent people who are part of this movement. Peter Thiel uh, is the co-founder of PayPal. He is a billionaire investor, first outside investor in Facebook. The guy knows a good bet when he sees one. He's co-founder of something called the Singularity Summit. There's that word singularity again. He's on the board of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, which is, uh, was formerly called the Singularity Institute. Uh, and he's the founder of an organization, a foundation, charitable foundation, that supports anti-aging research. He's also, if you're a conspiracy theorist like me, wear a tinfoil hat on the weekend, um, he's on the steering committee of the Bilderberg Group. Um, Google that. That's a, that would take a whole hour just to go through the Bilderberg Group and what it is. Um, another gentleman whose name I've already mentioned, Dr. Raymond Kurzweil. He is considered one of the most brilliant inventors of our age. Any musicians in here? Anyone play a musical instrument? Dr. Wabi, of course. You're familiar with the Kurzweil synthesizer? That was him. He's the author of a couple of very influential books in the transhumanist movement, one called The Age of Spiritual Machines. Again, a clue that they're looking at something that transcends the limits of our biology, spiritual machines, and the singularity is near. Dr. Kurzweil is trying to stay alive long enough for the technology to catch up so that he can live forever. Reportedly, he takes about 150 vitamin supplements per day, 8 to 10 glasses of alkaline water, 10 cups of green tea every day, 3 glasses of red wine per week to reprogram his biochemistry. He's in his uh, early 60s right now. He's in excellent health. Um, but the technology isn't there yet where if he were to suffer a massive coronary, where he could be preserved forever. And that's, what he's, that's his goal. He wants to live forever. He is also on the board of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute and a co-founder with Peter Thiel of the Singularity Summit, a gathering meeting of minds. There is a, um, he, he has a view of history in which he divides the epochs of history into six different periods of time and um, shows in his mind from whence we came and where we are going. I could explain it, but there's a, a video that I'd like to show you which does a much better job. A filmmaker, award-winning filmmaker, by the name of Jason Silva, has taken Dr. Kurzweil's six epochs of history and boiled it down to about three minutes. All right, so let's talk about the six epochs. Ray Kurzweil talks about the six epochs of evolution as leading us inexorably towards a technological singularity, a crescendo, an orgasm of cosmic proportion. He talks about epoch one, physics and chemistry, information stored in atomic structures. We move on then to epoch two, biology, information stored in DNA. We then get to epoch three, brains, information stored in neural patterns. We then move to epoch four, technology, information stored in our tools and software programs. Then we move to epoch five, what we're currently living through today, the merger of biology and technology, the extension of our cognition, outsourcing to our technological tools, the creation of the eye mind, the symbiosis between man and machine that turns us into something far greater, which eventually gets us to epoch six, the complete flourishing of nanotechnology and biotechnology. We impregnate the universe with intelligence. We merge with all the matter in the universe, and the universe essentially wakes up. Tell me that that is not an intoxicating idea, the kind of idea that inspired Alan Harrington to say, in my mind, having created the gods, we can turn into them. Again, the idea that the goal of technology is to turn humanity into gods. According to Dr. Kurzweil, and just in case you think he was exaggerating, this is a, taken from a presentation by Dr. Kurzweil outlining the six epochs of history. He would say that right now we're at epoch four in which we have information stored in hardware, in machines. And we're on the dawn of epoch five in which we begin to merge with technology 
to enhance our cognitive abilities and to extend our lives well beyond what our DNA would normally allow. The sixth epoch, of course, is one in which we merge with the cosmos, in which all of the dumb matter of the universe turns into a computing substrate, and we all become one with the cosmos. I'm no expert on Eastern religions, but as I understand it, that is essentially the, the loss of self into the cosmos is essentially a Buddhist concept, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but again, it's a spiritual concept, and this belief is held by those who believe that our future, our eternal home, lies in the cloud. Not the, the clouds, but, you know, the cloud. When does this begin to happen if we're on the verge of Epoch 5? Dr. Kurzweil thinks it'll happen by the year 2045. And he has said so publicly. He has predicted by 2045, humanity will achieve immortality. Not coincidentally, there is a 2045 institute. It is headed by this gentleman, Russian billionaire Dmitry Itzkov. Their goal is to create, by the year 2040, a hologram-like avatar into which we can upload and spend the rest of eternity, live forever. Their first goal, they appear to be on the edge of, or at least that's their plan, 2015 to 2020, they want to create a robotic copy of the human body, which can be remotely controlled through a brain-computer interface. The next step, of course, then, is to put the brain directly into the avatar. And then the third stage, an avatar with an artificial brain. What constitutes our minds somehow copied and uploaded into an artificial replica of a brain. The 2045 Institute had a um, gathering in New York City in the summer of 2013. A couple friends of mine attended to see what was going on. They had a number of um, scholars, researchers in the fields of genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology, also a number of religious thinkers and speakers that were there. Uh, these are some of the topics that were at the uh, conference, Global Future 2045. On the path to a new evolutionary strategy, future life supported by robotic avatars, androids for telepresence, mind uploading, and general intelligence, the goal of technology is the end of death, how human consciousness could be uploaded via quantum teleportation, Dr. Kurzweil's presentation, Immortality by 2045. And one by a friend of his, Dr. Peter Diamandis. And I guess this was important because they put it in all caps in the program. Uh, intelligent self-directed evolution drives mankind's metamorphosis into an immortal planetary meta-intelligence. Take note of this phrase, self-directed evolution. That keeps popping up in the writings and in the literature of those that are in the transhumanist movement. Uh, Dr. Diamandis um, spoke at the conference and he explained what he was talking about when he referred to this immortal planetary meta-intelligence. And as we begin to plug into the internet, as we begin to plug in through optogenetics or cortical implants, whatever it might be, and become a multicellular life form, this is where it gets interesting. This is where, for me, I see the future going. Because as I see us transitioning from literally the prokaryotic form of life to the multicellular form of life, <coughs> I see us coming online as a meta-intelligence. Because I think that as we start to interconnect our consciousness, our beings, who we are, we're going to start to become conscious at yet another level. And that next level, you know, whether it looks something like this, is what I believe is the ultimate form of our evolution. Dr. Diamandis was talking about our evolution from single-celled bacteria like that into the multicellular pinnacle of evolution that you see standing before you here this evening. And uh, relating that example to our individual conscious, our individual minds, seven billion us, uh, of us on planet Earth, somehow linked together, as you said, through cortical implants or optogenetics, which is a fascinating field. My wife understands it. I have no clue. Um, but Dr. Diamandis, just to give you his, uh, his uh, qualifications, not only does he have a degree in molecular genetics and aerospace engineering from MIT, he's got a uh, medical degree from Harvard Medical School. So... When this guy's talking about this stuff, 
just keep in mind, he's about as close as you'll find to a brain surgeon and a rocket scientist in one body. Um, so again, they've got some very intelligent people working on this idea. And I, again, the goal of the transhumanist movement, not just to extend or enhance the human experience, it is to transform and supplant the human experience into something new. We'll talk about Autodesk in a minute. They actually factor into this. Um, Dr. Diamandis also partnered with uh, Dr. Kurzweil in founding Singularity University. This is based out of the NASA North American uh, Space Administration. Uh, in uh, the research park out in California, they have uh, postgraduate programs for you know, top students, uh, bring them together with uh, uh, potential investors. Um, guys like Peter Thiel, who are looking for the next great idea into which they can put some money. Um, Singularity University has some backers with very deep pockets. Um, the founding corporate sponsors for Singularity University, Genentech, considered the founder of the biotech industry. Talking points from Genentech found their way into the congressional record during the debate over the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare if you prefer. Uh, Cisco Systems, maker of computer networking equipment, $46 billion in sales last year. Nokia, world's second largest cell phone manufacturer after Samsung and now part of Microsoft. Uh, Autodesk, leading developer of computer design software besides AutoCAD. Uh, they also uh, have created the software that has created scenes in, the, uh, in every Academy Award Best Visual Effects winner for the last 16 years. I didn't realize that. And that might be relevant if and when the day comes we can all afford those uh, Oculus Rift glasses and dive into virtual reality. Um, and of course, you might recognize that company there. Google has over one million servers and data centers around the world. They run over one billion search requests every day. They are arguably the most powerful internet company in the world. They have uh, been the company that the National Security Agency of the United States turned to for help when their servers were getting hacked. Google plays hardball politics. And they pledged $3 million to Singularity University for the next couple of years to keep the programs free. So why would a search engine company be interested in an educational, an educational program to work toward achieving the singularity, the point at which our biology and technology meet, merge, and transform humanity? I'm glad you asked. What has Google been up to lately? Believe it or not, Google has a secret laboratory. This Google X has invented, come up with the driverless car. You may have heard about that. Google Glass. Um, but they've also, since the beginning of 2013, the last two years, Google has literally spent billions, billions of dollars on robotics, basically buying out companies, acquiring companies that were heavily involved in robotics, neural network research, deep learning, natural language processing, and gesture recognition technology. One analyst who's looking at what Google has been doing and the companies that they've been buying said that they've embarked on the Manhattan Project of Artificial Intelligence. You familiar with the term the Manhattan Project? That was the official program name given by the United States government to the development of the atomic bomb during World War II. It was a crash program to develop the bomb before the Nazis could get one or the Japanese could get one. Apparently this is what Google's, except instead of racing the Nazis, Google is actually racing Facebook, which has its own artificial intelligence laboratory. So, perhaps it's just a coincidence, but maybe not, that at the beginning of 2013, just before Google began this spending spree, billions of dollars in buying up companies in robotics, artificial intelligence, neural network research, that they hired a brand new director of engineering named Dr. Raymond Kurzweil. Now, did they know when they hired Dr. Kurzweil that they were hiring a man who wants to live forever, wants to develop the technology to live forever? A man who has saved all of his late father's belongings, his personal papers, his music, his father was a, an orchestral conductor, um, photographs, mementos, 
and plans when the technology catches up to have his father's body exhumed, cloned, and reprogrammed with all of the stuff that he saved from his father's estate. His father passed away when Dr. Kurzweil was in his 20s. Dr. Kurzweil now is in his 60s. So he's been carrying this burden of grief for 40 years. Anyway, yes, Google knew what they were getting when they hired Dr. Kurzweil because you remember Google was a founding corporate sponsor of Dr. Kurzweil's Singularity University. So what does all of this mean? Where does this go from here? Singularitarianism, term coined by Dr. Kurzweil. Does it lead to heaven on a chip? Silicon heaven? Or does it lead to the Terminator scenario? Skynet, as Dr. Degaris is fears. That is an important question. And I think we need to consider some factors when we decide, or as we discuss whether, we should proceed down this path to develop a massively intelligent machine. A new entity, if you will, that is far more intelligent and perhaps far more powerful than we are. First, let's look at the premise of transhumanism. It, it is based, as Dr. Diamandis pointed out, on the presumption that humanity evolved from single-celled organism to what we are today. And there are at least some questions as to whether that is an accurate premise. About 10 years ago, a professor Hanneberg of the University of Adelaide in Australia conducted a study of the 200 existing examples of the human-like species, pre-human or proto-human, whatever you want to call them. The official term is homonym. Uh, Australopithecus, Neanderthal, Denisovan man. Uh, he did a study, measured the skulls, estimated the body weights for all of these samples, and I was surprised to find out that there are only 200 in the world. And we've got cemeteries here in Charleston that have more than 200 sets of remains, but there are apparently only 200 in the world. When he plotted these on a graph for size and for estimated body weight, he found that all 200 examples fit within a bell curve based on a standard deviation for modern man, Homo sapiens. Hence the title of the article, Believe It or Not, They're All the Same Species. Science, paleontologists, anthropologists, have divided these 200 samples, these 200 sets of remains, into 50 different species. Some of them are based on nothing more than a piece of a skull or a few teeth. Dr. Henneberg's contention is that all 200 are Homo sapiens. Australopithecus, Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, whatever you want to call them, they're all Homo sapiens. Now, he did not contend that this disproves Darwinian evolution. He said that this still shows uh, clear signs of evolution. They went from smaller to larger and, you know, as time went on. But that could be through the development of agriculture, through better organized society. There, there may be other explanations than evolution for that. I, I'm not an expert, not a scientist. I just have pretty good reading comprehension. And uh, I wonder if all, all 50 species of pre-human that according to the experts document human history for the last, what, four million years? Yeah, four million years. Where did, you know, where did we come from? What, what came before? Also, I don't know if you heard about uh, the last 10 years, the discovery of a T-Rex leg bone with the uh, blood vessels inside still preserved. Triceratops horn. The paleontologist at North Carolina State, Mary Schweitzer, discovered that. Now they're trying to figure out how soft tissue, like blood vessels, which until now, according to science, there is no possible way it could be preserved for more than a few thousand years, even if frozen can be preserved for 65 million years because we know that dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. So anyway, just a question. Is the premise accurate? Did we evolve from a lower life form? Is it our ultimate destiny to evolve through self-directed evolution into something else? Secondly, um, transhumanism wants to reject the concept of human exceptionalism, the idea that humanity sits atop the pyramid, if you will, of developed species on this planet. In fact, 
some transhumanists believe that not only should rights be extended to other species, such as, say, chimpanzees or dolphins, um, that we must, as a species, overcome the bias against non-carbon-based life forms. That we need to fight against substrate discrimination. See, substrate discrimination is discriminating against an intelligence just because it happens to be based on silicon or some other element. And that we need to reject carbon chauvinism, anthropomorphism, speciesism, bioism, or even fundamentalist humanism. And you notice this is from the Singularity weblog, a transhumanist manifesto. Um, the irony, of course, is that since we are the only species on the planet capable of having this uh, conversation and even contemplating these concepts, that by definition sort of argues that humans are kind of exceptional. But there are those who believe that uh, we do need to extend rights to other species, other uh, living things. There have been um, some court rulings in recent years, and you'll see more of these, I think, in the years ahead. A uh, court in Brazil recently extended rights to a chimpanzee, said it had to be freed from the zoo. Its rights were being violated. And New Zealand court ruled that a river had to be driven. You can't call it human rights. What they're calling it is personal rights, the idea of personhood instead of human rights. And this is kind of a slippery slope because this rejects the idea that human life has value just because it exists. And this can be a dangerous, dangerous concept. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, personhood theory is based on the idea that anything, any entity, I can't even say animal, any entity that has a certain minimum level of cognition, thinking ability, should be classified as a person and thus entitled to rights, protection under the law. The danger of this is that while you can create non-human persons, the flip side of that is that you can also create non-person humans, people whose cognitive abilities are damaged, whether through genetics or through an accident. There was a case just a few years ago of a woman in Florida named Terry Schiavo who fell down a set of stairs, went into a coma, and a judge ruled that her ex-husband, who was given, given a guardian status over her parents, her ex-husband was allowed to uh, have her dehydrated to death because she's, she's in a coma, she's not thinking, she's not entitled to protection under the law. Sadly, this can also be applied if you really extend the logic way out there. There is a bioethicist at Princeton University named Peter Singer who argues that because children up to the age of two are not really self-aware, that parents should be allowed to terminate them if they choose because they're not really persons yet. They've not achieved that minimum level of cognition to be considered persons and entitled to the law. That, unfortunately, is one aspect of transhumanism that needs to be considered watched and rejected. And again, not all transhumanists are going to go this way. I'm not trying to claim or slander all in this movement. I've had some dealings and some interviews with several of these people, and I, I genuinely like them. I think they're trying to solve what they see as a genuine problem in the human condition, which is suffering and death. They just, in general, have a better, a more optimistic view of the role of government in uh, overseeing all of this than I do. Uh, I also believe there's a danger that this movement could lead to a permanent stratification of society, genetic haves and have-nots. I mean, we, we see this already with economics, that those who are well off, the wealthy, will try to influence the system to preserve what they have. We see this with special interest groups, uh, lobbyist groups in Washington, D.C., and the way they try to influence Congress to pass laws that will protect their business interests at the expense of everyday working people. What would happen over the course of several generations if the wealthy, because it will be the wealthy who have first access to these cutting edge technologies, the ability to select for genetics in their offspring, in their children. In fact, just last week, the uh, parliament in the United Kingdom passed a law that allowed for three parent babies 
So there's a certain type of genetic defect, um, mitochondrial DNA defect, in which uh, a woman's mitochondrial DNA uh, defective can be passed on to a child, which leads to all kinds of uh, health issues, mortality issues. Um, that can be corrected by taking the mitochondrial DNA from a donor and implanting it in the egg of the mother. But the result is that the child actually has DNA from three parents. Not much from the donor, but some. So a three-parent child. The opposition to this law in the UK was that it opens the door to and saying, well, if we can do that, why can't we decide while we're in there already that we want our baby to have blue eyes or blonde hair or be, you know, six foot nine and muscular so he can be a starting power forward for the Chicago Bulls? Why not? If they have the ability to do it and the ability to pay is what I should have said, why not? The problem is that after a few generations of producing children who are smarter, healthier, stronger, better looking than the rest of us, what happens to those who have and those who have not? I think you permanently stratify society. And that is a danger in this particular movement as well, as we get, because we are on the verge of having the ability to start selecting the genetic characteristics of our children. And to be honest with you, you know, as a father of a 25-year-old daughter that I love with all my heart, if I'd had the ability to say, I want to make sure genetically that she lives a long and healthy life, I'd give almost anything to be able to do that. But where does that stop? And what happens to those in those parts of the world where they will never have the resources to be able to afford something like this? Sadly, in trying to solve a problem, I think this movement may be a, creating a worse problem. This phrase that I mentioned earlier, and I just want to emphasize this for a moment, just to reinforce the idea that what transhumanism is about at its core, self-directed evolution. This is from the website of a woman named Dr. Natasha Vita Moore. She's a very prominent spokesperson, thinker, philosopher in the transhumanist movement. She, in fact, is the chairperson of Humanity Plus, which was formerly called the World Transhumanist Association. Um, yeah, you look her up on Google. She she's, uh, attends all and speaks at all the major conferences. She's, she's been a part of this movement for quite some time and is very prominent in the movement. Um, Self-directed evolution. A transhumanist's journey to becoming gods, you notice on the web address there. Uh, a book about the politics of the transhumanist movement. Self-directed evolution. Um, another article from the uh, Institute of... Um, I'm going to forget the, the total name, Ethical Technology, um, I-E-E-T is the, uh, the uh, acronym. Uh, that's a website where you can find a lot of articles from thinkers in the transhumanist movement. Again, central transhumanist idea of self-directed evolution, a phrase that's, that appears over and over again. In fact, last night I interviewed the, uh, the transhumanist candidate for president in 2016, a gentleman named Zoltan Istvan. I'll talk more about him in a minute. And I asked him. Is it fair to characterize the transhumanist movement as self-directed evolution? He said, oh yeah, absolutely. Well, why is that an important phrase? Because about 80, 90 years ago, there was another organization that was very prominent, considered to be the pinnacle of science in the 1920s, 1930s, that used the phrase self-directed evolution. It was the International Eugenics Association, this is the cover from a program that uh, was handed out at the Second International Eugenics Congress, handed out in 1921. Uh, eugenics, are you familiar with the term? Eugenics is a term that means essentially self-directed survival of the fittest. It was a science that attempted to determine which bloodlines, genetic lines, should be allowed to reproduce and which unfit members of society should not be allowed to reproduce. Those considered unfit would be the lazy, the, the sick, the feeble-minded, uh, those with problems with uh, drugs and alcohol, um, those who depended on government assistance. They were considered a drag on society, a drain on society's resources. 
And here in the United States, we led the movement in eugenics. Again, considered the pinnacle of, of, of science in the 1920s and 1930s. The second International Eugenics Congress was held at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. It was presided over by a gentleman named Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was no slouch. Henry Fairfield Osborne was the man who described for the scientific publications the Tyrannosaurus Rex. He also named it and the Velociraptor. So this was a guy who was very influential in the field 90 years ago. And you'll notice the uh, motto of the Eugenics Congress right there in the middle of the program. Eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. There was an organization in New York that kept detailed notes on every baby born in the United States from like 1905 until about 1935, thereabouts. They were trying to track who was being born to who. L look this up, Google this later tonight. Eugenics, United States, uh, and just look at the images, the Google images that'll come back. I mean, there were county fairs across the United States back in the 20s and 30s where they would have families that were presented in like a little, you know, you'd, you'd go to the little displays and you'd see the, the goats over here and the calves and the cows over here and, you know, the, the little pigs over here. And then you'd have this, this healthy looking family with a big strapping dad and a, and a, you know, motherly figure and all these healthy kids running around. This is the ideal family. And those are the, that's what they wanted to reproduce, to build a strong America. Just to show you that that wasn't the work of an overzealous marketing guy, 1932, the third International Eugenics Congress, self-direction of human evolution, again, the same logo, all of these roots representing different branches of science, leading to the flowering of a healthy tree. This was also held at the American Museum of Natural History. At the end of the Congress in 1932, a gentleman by the name of Ernst Rudin R-U-D-I-N, was unanimously elected president of the International Federation of Eugenic Societies. At the conclusion of this Congress, he went back home to Germany, where he wrote the 1933 Law for the Prevention of Hereditarily Diseased Offspring for Adolf Hitler. You see, Germany, Adolf Hitler, who got a little bit of a reputation for its eugenics program. Let's eliminate the unfit, by which we mean Slavs, Gypsies, homosexuals, Jews. They based their program on the one that was in place in the state of California in the United States. California's program was taken from a program developed in Indiana. And here in the United States, women were being sterilized without their knowledge or consent because they were considered unfit mothers until the 1970s. Transhumanism and eugenics, self-directed evolution. And just to show you that this has continued into the present day, gentlemen I mentioned earlier, Zoltan Istvan, transhumanist party candidate for president in 2016, in August wrote this article for Wired. It's time to consider restricting human breeding. Now, I've talked to Zoltan a couple of times in the last year, and he's a nice guy. I like him. Our worldviews are fundamentally opposed, but I believe after talking to him that he didn't write this because he's trying to create the master race. I think he sees a problem. You see by the heading of the article here, given the number of children that starve each day, dwindling planetary resources in the coming transhumanist era. Well, he sees, what is it, on average 10,000 children per day starving to death in a world where in the upper Midwest, North Dakota, South Dakota, they've got corn from 2013's harvest still in the bins up there because the price of a bushel dropped to two and a half dollars a bushel. Doesn't pay to get them to you know, put it on a train and move it. But there are people starving to death on the other side of the world. Just Zoltan sees the problem as one of distribution of resources. But rather than attacking the distribution problem, he wants to limit the number of people who can actually have children. I see it differently. I think there are different issues that result in starvation, but we can save that for question and answer if you like. Uh, 
So anyway, it is a, uh, an idea that continues today. Zoltan Ishvan is an important thinker. He's very good with social media and getting his ideas out. He writes three daily columns on the web. Uh, Huffington Post, he writes one for um, Vox, and there's one other website, I forget. But he's also the author of this novel, The Transhumanist Wager, which uh, was why I talked to him the first time. Um, any of you familiar with Ayn Rand and the book Atlas Shrugged? It, it was a, really, it was a, it was a, a philosophy, a, a manifesto in the form of a novel. It came out uh, when, 1940s, 1950s? Uh, basically, it uh, talked about the evils of people who depended on other people to provide for them, people who depended on the state uh, to give them entitlements. Um, the transhumanist wager has been described as Atlas Shrugged for the transhumanist movement. It is a very clear, bold, uh, almost aggressive statement of transhumanist thought. It is a philo philosophical manifesto in the form of a novel. It's worth reading just to get a better understanding of what transhumanism is and where it might lead. Uh, interestingly, now that he's running for president, he's had to back away from it because his hero in the novel is willing to do everything, anything, in order to achieve his goals. And when you're a transhumanist, if you're an atheist, which Zoltan is, um, that worldview makes sense. If you believe that your only possible means of staying alive forever is to somehow develop the technology to stay alive before you die, then anyone who tries to stop you is essentially committing murder or trying to murder you. And so therefore you have the right to defend yourself with lethal force if necessary. So that leads to some interesting conflicts perhaps between where the transhumanist movement is going to go and people who are saying, as I am, now wait a minute, we might have some problems here. He's developed what he calls the three laws of transhumanism which define his philosophy. His philosophy is teleological egocentric functionalism, or TEF for short. His three laws of transhumanism. First, a transhumanist must safeguard one, one owns existence, one's own existence, above all else. Above all else. Second, a transhumanist must strive to achieve omnipotence as expediently as possible. Omnipotence, godhood so long as one's actions do not conflict with the first law. And law number three, a transhumanist must safeguard value in the universe so long as one's actions do not conflict with the first and second laws. Now, not all transhumanists agree with those laws. Some who are in that movement and like the thought of being able to live forever in their current bodies aren't prepared to go as far as the uh, protagonist of the novel. In other words, to do anything that it takes in order to preserve his own life. But this does sort of lay out the logical extreme, the logical end of where transhumanist thought goes. Again, if you believe your only path to immortality is by creating the technology to get there as fast as possible, then anyone who stands in your way needs to be eliminated because they are trying to kill you. They want you to die. And for the transhumanist, death is optional. It is no longer acceptable. So there are some very important questions, though. Um, first of all, if they do create a massively intelligent machine, a sentient supercomputer, or say Terminator, something that becomes the new dominant form of life on Earth, would this new superintelligence think of us mere unenhanced humans as anything more than a nuisance. And if they would, would they have any qualms about eliminating us? Any, any more remorse about eliminating us than I have about eliminating the ants that invade my kitchen every summer? Perhaps not. Leads to another question. As we try to create an artificial superintelligence, how do we program it with morality? And whose morality do we program into it? Christian morality? Which denomination of Christian morality? Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, Muslim? Whose morality gets put into that machine? I mean, beyond how we do it, I, I, the, the people who are researching this don't even know how yet. But if they figure out the how, then on what basis? How can we program into it human 
values or, or uh, perceptions like beauty or, or love, justice. How do we accomplish those things? I think those are very important questions to ask. Is immortality really to be found on a, ch on a chip, on a wafer of silicon? And I think maybe most important, given mankind's history over the last 6,000 years of recorded history, heck, just you know, watch the news for the last week or so, or check YouTube, watch that video of that Jordanian Air Force pilot going up in flames inside that cage. Does it make sense to build a new super intelligence on the foundation of humanity? Those are the questions that we leave for you. Dr. Wabi and I, between us, we may have uh, I don't know, 40 or 50 years between the two of us left in this world, but you all have a lot longer, I hope. Uh, these are questions that your generation is going to be confronted with. I don't have a problem with technology uh, per se. Um, there are, I could see some advantages to uh, having certain parts of my body that worked a little better than they do. This knee really starts to ache every time the temperature changes or the uh, pressure changes. Starting to develop a little arthritis in these joints. That's one thing. There's some things that have come out of this technology, these, this research, that are really useful. Sight is being restored to those who are blind. There are those who can move now through uh, the development of exoskeletons who were, have been paralyzed. I think that's awesome. But where this is going, the transhumanist movement is going, is essentially taking on the form of a new religion. They're looking for immortal life. They're looking to become, in the words of a, a serpent who spoke long, long ago, to be as gods. Is that a good thing? Our generation has to leave that for you to decide. Thank you. Now, did you like what you heard? Big yes or big no? Did you feel it's different than anything that you expected? Another yes? No? If you don't talk, I'll talk. <laughs> um, do you think he's a good speaker? Would you give him another hand? <laughs> and with this, we start a few minutes of questions and answers and comments even. If you don't have a question or answer, just have a comment. What do you think? Let me start by putting something in front of us. If you have always thought of technology as gadgets and computers and um, iPhone and I uh, do whatever uh, technology thing, and every year the progress would be this way, but never thought that it can touch us and become and we become not human beings, but something else. If that's, that, that's new to you today, wave at me. I tell you 99% of the people, maybe 990 point, point something, of people think of technology like this, apparatuses and um, gadgets and things to, our create, creations, right? We said that the first day, that uh, we create technology, right? But have you ever, thought that this technology, we will use it someday to change us, to become different than something. It's not like just having another arm or artificial arm or artificial kidney or something. We will be new, new species. New species. It will be something totally different. And you and I will become old fashioned. In 2045, they look at us, oh, you are old fashioned. Oh, you are still. <laughs> You have dad and mom and, uh, oh no, we have. Well, ask him a question. Say something. We will go one by one and ask him. This is the last time he will be with us. He will leave. So, this is your Kyle. Kyle? Yeah. We will tape this so that we have it on the tape. All right. Um, I had a question about those uh, epochs we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I understand, like, the whole... Uh, 
mm-hmm. nanotechnology and interfacing, you know, genetics with uh, essentially robots to, uh, you know, uh, heal us faster and make us li- live longer. But my question is, is where where that line is defined where we are actually not human anymore? Mm. That. That's a really good question, and there have already been some uh, conferences with bioethicists and, and researchers to try to determine this line, to figure out what constitutes humanity. If we get to a situation where we are part mechanical, part cyborg, uh, at what point are you no longer human? Right. There are legal experts who are weighing in on this, too. How, what percentage of uh, artificial components can you have before you're no longer considered human under the law? How does that affect your legal standing? I think that's one of the reasons that this personhood theory is coming about. They want to take genetics out of it so that we don't have to argue that point anymore. Just say, you know, if, you can, if you've got the cognitive level of you know, X, whatever that arbitrary level is, then you're a person and entitled to protection under the law. But as I said, the flip side of that is that there are some people, people in a coma, for example, very small children, uh, who might then, under the law, be considered non-person humans and not entitled to legal protection. But that's an excellent question, and that's one of the issues that bioethicists are wrestling with right, right now. Yeah. Where do we draw that line? I don't have an answer for that right now. So let me build on this question of Kyle's and the answer of Derek. If uh, I can have artificial arm and uh, hand and artificial leg and artificial eye, and artificial everything actually, even heart now and kidney and everything. So if uh, we had uh, a person who had a bad accident and had to have all these pieces and it's doable, I think, it's not so far-fetched. Mm-hmm. Um, would he still, but he still thinks and he still knows that he is John Smith, for example, or she is uh, Anusha something. Uh, would they still be, they cross the line, they are no more because they have many parts that are not real? I don't know. Um, I think one, one of the, uh, Maybe one of the dividing lines would be whether or not these, these changes could be trans, transferred down to the next generation. Uh, so whether the, the genome was actually modified. Um, yeah, that's a tough question. Uh, again, uh, there are people who've been preserved, whose lives have been preserved artificially through uh, uh, um, the, the, the artificial heart, for example. Um, uh, uh, the, the old, uh, and I'm not thinking of the right word, the respirator, the, the, the iron lung, you know, back in the days of polio. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you might make an argument, in fact, some of the transhumanists do make the argument that we are already, in some sense, transhuman. Uh, the fact that um, we have these handheld electronic devices in which we can store our calendars and our contact lists and uh, notes uh, means we are essentially the first people in history, in all of human history, who never needs to be late for a movie ever again or for class because we've got it all right here. In a sense, we've, ex- we've extended the capabilities of our minds through these handheld devices. So I think that's stretching the definition some. I think that will be true when we start implanting those inside. In, inside. And there is some work being done on that score right now. My wife was telling me about something today. Uh, and of course, I've forgotten what it is. She's the one who graduated with you know, high honors in molecular biology with a genetics component. I'm not, <laughs> I was an econ major. Um, but we're, we're getting to the point where those changes can be transferred genetically from one generation down to the next. And uh, again, these are issues, uh, legal, philosophical, ethical, moral, spiritual issues that need to be addressed really soon. Okay, now if, hey, here's a comment. Uh, to branch off that, um, like, the understanding of being human is through, like, you know, emotion and touch and perception and all that. Now, if we were to, you know, exponentially change with technology, it's just kind of, like, uh, it's intriguing to understand the fact of, like, how they would actually perceive everything. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think that that's where they, that defining line is because they're going to see the whole entire world completely different. Yeah. And that's what Dr. Diamandis was, was talking about when he, uh, the gentleman at the Global Future 2045 Congress, when he was talking about uh, transforming from essentially single-celled organisms into one giant 
you know, eye mind, to use another phrase from the other presentation, uh, through uh, optogenetics, which is again a whole other field, is basically genes being switched on and off through frequencies of light, uh, or implants where we can all hear each other's thoughts. I don't want people hearing my thoughts all the time. And especially now that we live in this post 9 11 world where the government feels the right to listen in on our phone calls and read our email <laughs> and listen to my OnStar while I'm driving my car. Can you imagine that? The NSA is requiring companies like Apple and Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Verizon, AT&T, to allow them access through the back door into all of these devices that we have here. Just last week, there was a disclaimer in the, uh, Samsung. Uh, the Samsung Smart TV, right, the privacy statement that said, don't say anything in front of the TV that you wouldn't want to get out because you might accidentally trigger the voice activation, the voice activated app, it would record the conversation and it might be shared with a third party. Who's the third party? How are they listening? And if we're all connected to one another into a hive mind, who's listening? And how might they use that? And would it be just a one-way conversation? Might it be a two-way conversation where thoughts are being pushed into your mind through this connection? that you might not otherwise have had. What is the meaning of the word hive? A hive mind is basically where, uh, well, as Dr. Diamandis said, we would all be functioning as individual units, but functioning together as one giant global consciousness. It's kind of like bees. Like bees. Yeah, right. And this is interesting because this gets into the spiritual aspect of it. I, I do a longer presentation. Well, actually, not much longer. Um, in, in which I talk about this, there was a, uh, there's a concept called the noosphere that was uh, popularized by a Jesuit priest in the 1940s and 50s by the name of Pierre Tellard de Chardin. Um, he borrowed that, the term from an earlier generation of Russian mystic philosophers who were called cosmists, which was the term you heard Dr. Hugo de Garris refer to. Cosmists believe uh, and there was one gentleman in particular named uh, Verdansky who originally originated the concept of the noosphere. He said, that we, we live in the, this earth where you've got the, uh, uh, the geosphere, which is the planet itself, the biosphere, which is life on top of the planet, and then the noosphere, N-O-O sphere, which is social interaction, social network. In fact, uh, Tellard used the phrase social network in the 50s, and so for some people he's considered the father of the internet. But the idea was that at some point, as humanity and all of life evolves into greater complexity and greater sentience, that these thoughts, emotions, words, feelings that we share with one another through our social networks would eventually wake up. And that he called that point the omega point, which would be the point we become one with the cosmos, one with the universe. You can see Dr. Uh, Kurzweil adopted the omega point and calls it now the singularity. Same thing. It's a spiritual concept. Now, the Jesuits, the Roman Catholic Church, they didn't like this much when uh, uh, Father Pierre put this out back in the 40s and 50s, but it has found its way into mainstream Roman Catholic thought now. Pope Benedict has praised him. Uh, Pope uh, Francis has praised him. Uh, and so it's, it's an idea that we're evolving toward this point that we'll become one with the cosmos. And the transhumanists are aiming at the same target. They just think we're going to do it through technology. We'll become the hive mind. Well, if you hear the word uh, geosphere for the first time, wave at me. Geosphere. Write it in your report, and you'll find it in a dictionary. And uh, Derek just mentioned it, geosphere. And uh, the word biosphere, if you hear it for the first time, wave at me. Very good. Write it. And find it in a dictionary. And then the, th the third one is, the third one is? Noosphere. Noosphere. N-O-O-sphere. Mm -hmm. If you hear the noosphere for the first time, wave at me. I only you heard it for the first time a year ago, so. See, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. By the way, when you wave at me, you're waving at yourself as well. Really? That's nice. I mean, you're just, uh, so we have three words at least in, in less than 30 seconds that we are getting to know. And hive mind 
if you hear that term for the first time, I know mine, you heard it before, but hive mine, wave at me. Excellent, how educational is this? <laughs> uh, so right hive mine, and he mentioned something about it, explained it to us, go to a dictionary and give me the link. In your reports, we want a link that's clickable, make it clickable in your report, so I can go and, and read with you. In this class, I told you in day one, that we are not going only to do the gadgets thing and talk about technologies and uh, so forth. We looked at Mars. I mean, this was kind of the hit of the day, going to Mars. And, uh, but I told you that this is a life-changing class because we will meet ourselves. You will meet yourself, you will meet yourself, I will meet myself together in a friendly uh, atmosphere. And this way, for example, you meet yourself in three, four, uh, uh, terms, right? Right away. What were they? Geosphere, biosphere, say with me, and noosphere, and hive mind. You met yourself, said, hi, myself. I didn't know that before. Nice meeting you. See what I mean? So we discover ourselves that we didn't know something a minute ago, now we know it. So we are different, right? Now, if you wanted to ask Iran about what do they think about this, uh, uh, you said hive mind that becomes uh, uh, something like that. All uh, the ticket, how much to Iran? We will come to you and you tell us from Iran. And then, yes, and we will ask Nigeria and we will ask India and who else? Let's come to Iran. What do you think of this? He First trans of all, I didn't get the point of this word, actually. What was that, exactly? Okay, very good. He's here. Ask him. The point of the hive mind is yeah. that, uh, at least in some, the minds of some transhumanists... Sorry. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. To, to be honest with you, I don't see the point of it either, because again, I don't want to be interconnected with the rest of the planet. All the minds will be connected, so I, I know you, you're thinking, you know what I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah. But Dr. Diamandis and there are some others in the transhumanist movement who believe that that is ultimately the end point of human evolution, that we become one as a species and then ultimately one with the cosmos. Uh, again, it's not just, a, there's just not technological implications here, there are also spiritual implications here. So, how Iran would take this or well, I think that, you know, since since we believe in molarity, it's like, you know, we have connected to each other, by the way, in terms of mind and vision to the world. So I think that it's it's an old world, by the way, in my, in my perspective, you know. So uh, in Iran, yes, why not? Because, you know, it's all about culture. And, you know, in uh, Eastern countries, like, you know, we are so close in terms of, uh, uh, you know, cultural uh, interaction, you know, like traditional way of communication and mostly r religious ones, by the way. So I think that, yeah, yeah, in Iran we have, we definitely have. <laughs> okay. yeah. Now let's go to Nigeria with the same flight and see uh, what the aeroplane would tell us. Um, well, I think there should be a kind of way that you you have the freedom to choose what you want to share with others. I mean, it shouldn't be just a pool of thoughts where you don't have control of what you want to let how. So if that can be achieved, I think it, it could be cool. But if it's just like a bug in your system, mm -hmm. I don't think I like it. <laughs> so in other words, the hive mind means like somebody has a big mind and has many members, so we really become members in the body yes. but that has one mind in, in, in so that. My question is, is it possible for you to choose what you want to share with those that your mind, that you, your mind is unified with? Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, in fact, it, there's, there's no certainty that, they can, that this can actually be achieved. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think the question is, should we try to achieve it? Now, if it's achieved, whoever will make it can make the design to make it full automatic. I mean, so you don't control, it's just <laughs> <laughs> like the TV. I mean, the TV can, uh, can, uh, yes, the TV can record you. Um, yeah. uh, as if in that case, uh, we don't have all these classes and all, I guess. 
<laughs> because don't we don't have all these lectures, classes, and all. Because as I can read your mind, I'll I'll get everything through that. <laughs> we, we don't have these lectures and all <laughs> in my scenario. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> and uh, I have one question regarding this transhumanism, like. Uh, if this really comes into picture, is it like uh, the transhuman will not have any health problems and uh, their lifetime would be forever or uh, they would be, uh, they would not get aged and old like this? Maybe, uh, like is that any possible, is there any possibility for that? Well, I, I think that's, that's certainly the goal or at least that's certainly the way it would be presented to us as a way to eliminate suffering and I think for many of the people who are in this movement um, that that really is their concern uh, for, for example Dr. Uh, Dr. Kurzweil who wants to resurrect his father I think he's motivated by grief now I'm no expert but somebody who would go to such an extent that and, and to say publicly and again, he is no fool. Again, he's considered one of the most brilliant inventors that the world has produced of the last hundred years. To say publicly, I plan to resurrect my father. When the technology catches up, I will have him exhumed and reprogram with all of these things that I've saved from his, his estate. That, so I, I think that there's a genuine desire there to eliminate, or at least, well, to eliminate human suffering. Suffering caused by just living. You get to a certain age, I'm 53, I have parts of my body that hurt for no apparent reason. It would be nice to eliminate that. I'm not sure I'd like to live beyond 120 years, though. Once you get to immortality, in the last class, somebody asked a very intelligent question. So we achieve immortality by the year 2045, then what? What do you do with the rest of, immor with the rest of time? I don't know the answer to that question. Commit suicide. Yeah, you get to a point, I've done everything, it's, and uh, I've, I've had enough, I'm, I'm bored. Still, the person doesn't die, right? So if he was immortal, he doesn't die. He if he's so, if he, yeah. yeah. So even if he wanted to die, yeah. he is in prison. Yes. I cannot die. That's what. I want to die. <coughs> <laughs> I think they'll just create another world for the people who just want to commit suicide. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> another. Uh, yeah. And uh, maybe uh, it has so many negative points compared to the positives. It's uh, it's showing us because uh, like. If, if in that way we keep creating our people, it's like uh, the population goes unlimited and we'll face problems with that too. Then not, o not even Mars, we have to acquire three, four planets more. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but, if we, if, but if we achieve omnipotence, perhaps we can go out into the cosmos and uh, into the universe and, and you know, create new planets of our own. I think that's the goal. Uh, that was certainly the goal of the Russian cosmists, uh, thinkers like Verdansky of 100 years ago. They believed that humans, uh, the ultimate uh, end of, of uh, evolution was to become one with the cosmos and spend the rest of eternity floating around on the stars and, and, and doing whatever. Uh, so it's not a new idea. You know, in fact, I alluded to a, a biblical verse because you know, I, I am a Christian, but I mean, this was you know, the very first lie in, in recorded human history. Ye shall be as gods. That is the goal of many in this movement. Now, not all. Again, there are some who simply see this as a way to try to eliminate human suffering. And I commend them for that. But being somewhat of a, a student of history myself and looking back over the 6,000 years of recorded history, we see that the one thing that humanity has consistently improved upon with each passing generation is the ability to kill one another and to cause pain on one another. So if we do enhance humanity to the point that we become massively intelligent, omnipotent supermen, are we just enhancing our ability to do each other harm as well? That's a serious question that needs to be asked and addressed before we create the Superman. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can go back into history. There was a, there's a, a, uh, an archaeological site uh, dates back to about 3500 BC in uh, northeastern Syria, southeastern uh, uh, Turkey. It's called Hamukar. And they found that in 3500 BC, they were using bullets they were made of clay, thrown by slingshots. But they dug up the city and they found the aftermath of this city. It had been burned to the ground and the remains of all of these clay bullets that had been shot at one another 5,500 years ago. Uh, humankind is very experienced. We have a long and bloody history on this planet. And 
It, th that is my concern. There are people out there, and, and you, you best believe, if we, the technology that I know about is just stuff that I can read about on the internet or see on the news. I don't have any secret sources in government laboratories anywhere. You better believe that there are researchers working for DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency here in the United States, and counterparts in Russia and China, England, Germany, around the world, who are way beyond what you know, I, I talked about here tonight. They're talking about whether or not it's ethical to put autonomous killer robots onto the battlefield and to let these robots decide who they shoot at. <laughs> Terminator! But now, like I said, that's, that's a simple you know, reaction to this. But I, again, I think there's some more nuanced fact, things that we need to consider. Um, you know, and again, I keep coming back to the eugenics movement because it's so recent we should know better. I mean, I would think that even within the transhumanist movement, if they just looked back a couple of generations said, oh gee, these eugenicists were talking about self-directed evolution. Maybe we shouldn't use that phrase in our marketing. But no, and again, it's because I don't think that that's what they're thinking, but who controls how the technology gets used? At some point, a government agency is going to step in and want to regulate and control it. And I try to gauge my reaction to any new government policy by whether or not I would want the person I have to deal with at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles when I go to get my driver's license administering that new policy. Do you want the bureaucrat sitting behind the desk deciding whether or not you can have a child or whether or not you can upgrade your child? How much influence is the rich guy at the end of the street going to have when he goes to get his breeder's license? Things like that. Those are the things that I'm concerned about. Just maybe I'm skeptical because I'm older. I do believe that most of the transhumanists that I've met so far genuinely want to solve human problems. I just think human history indicates we tend to act in our own selfish interests first to the exclusion of all others. In fact, uh, Mr. Zoltan, I interviewed last night, the transhumanist party candidate for president, said America needs to develop an artificial intelligence first before the Russians can get one. Thank you. Let's go to India before I see Kyle will come to America soon. But let's see India. We have two Indians here. Yeah. Talking about the hive mind, if uh, uh, what I have understood from you is that uh, minds, uh, minds and uh, information is connected all throughout the world. So if uh, unless uh, I guess no one can regulate uh, uh, anything to do. I mean, just now you have spoken about the uh, government regulations and uh, all those things to control technology, but uh, I don't think that would uh, even be happen because everyone has been uh, ha has the uh, connectivity, so some can implant other other thoughts into uh, people who can uh, make uh, uh, regulations. So how would that that happen? I would get <laughs> what, what would lead to an uh, endless point. Yeah, it's uh, well, you know, it's that's worth considering. I mean, uh, we we see that uh, what is it the the hacker group anonymous is uh, now hacking the websites of the Islamic State to try to take those down. But you have to think about that too. I mean, you know, I've had two debit cards that I've had to trade in over the last year because somebody hacked Home Depot and uh, another store, and I don't even know what the other store was, but my bank said, you gotta come in and swap out your card because if the chip's in my head, then what? I don't, I don't want my head hacked. And you best believe that if that is how we're connected, that somebody out there is going to try to figure out a way to do it. Or a government will build in a back door. It's, again, it, it's, it's worth addressing the question now before we get to the point that it's too late. And there are even researchers in this field, like Dr. DeGaris, who believe that these issues are so important they need to be addressed. There's a, uh, a think tank at the uh, University of Oxford in uh, England, uh, and I think it's the... Um, Future of Humanity Institute, I believe. Uh, a gentleman named Nick Bostrom is in charge of it. I interviewed a fellow who's a, fe uh, a gentleman who's a fellow there, uh, Dr. Stuart Armstrong, uh, about the need to program safeguards into artificial intelligence and how we go about doing it. And he admitted that they don't know how to do it. They're meeting on it, though. They're trying to figure out how to do it before an artificial intelligence wakes up <coughs> because they understand that this could be 
a species threatening development. They consider the greatest threats to human survivability to be a, uh, a killer pandemic, a uh, dinosaur killer meteorite or meteor asteroid hitting the earth, or number three, an artificial superintelligence that decides it's evil. So, get it. Um, I'm noticing a lot of correlation between um, Raymond Kurzweil and the singular, the Singularity University. Mm -hmm. and, and now that you pointed out that he is the new director of engineering at Google, uh, I'm just trying to inquire on the fact that let's say they do figure it out and like there is that 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 paradigm of human species it starts off with one right mm -hmm. so presumably. Pres pr presumably and they create this one new species that um, that they don't even know what what like it would even think about or anything like that wouldn't that couldn't he then to just like get out and create the species that he wants or go beyond that? You should read a novel uh, called Avogadro Corp. A-V-O-G-A-D-R-O. I think that's it. Avogadro Corp. By a gentleman named William Hertling. H-E-R-T-L-I-N-G. Avogadro is uh, a reference to a, a number, just like Google is a reference to a number. So it's a thinly veiled reference to Google. Um, and in the plot of this novel, the uh, email program that they've developed, which was intended to predict what you wanted to know before you knew you needed to know it, and would be able to write your email in a very persuasive way in order to get people to do things you want them to do, gets out into the wild. And chaos ensues. So it's, it's, it's actually very well done. Uh, and I'd like to interview him. We just haven't been able to connect yet. But Avogadro Corp is a, a real interesting look at what might come of exactly that scenario. Okay, we have two idiots here. I think we'll go back and then we'll come back to you. Come back to you. Uh, hi, Dr. Gilbert. Uh, I need your, your view uh, on two points regarding uh, transhumanism and teleportation. What would be the world if, if you have both uh, uh, transhumanism and teleportation at the same time? Transhumanism and teleportation at the same time? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question because they're talking about now uh, developing a very simple form of teleportation using 3D printer technology. Are you familiar with the concept of 3D printers? Okay. Uh, so if you've got a certain organic, uh, organic stock on both ends uh, if you're able to scan something. I, I think what they're talking about in using it is uh, in uh, situations now for uh, medicines where if you have somebody who comes into a, a hospital in a remote area and they've got a disease and they need a certain type of medication uh, and perhaps even something that could be uh, tailored specifically to their genetic component. That somebody uh, at uh, a, uh, a medical facility uh, with, with the resources to do some very quick research could then beam from their laboratory to this other 3D printer on the other end exactly what's needed in the form of the, uh, the correct compound. So it's, it's not teleportation exactly, but it's a simple early form of that teleportation. I, the, the idea being that at some point down the road, if you could develop a scanner that was fine enough to scan Dr. Wabi head to toe and you know like the Star Trek teleportation you wouldn't exactly be beaming him through space but you would be making a copy creating a new copy on the other end presumably destroying the copy on this end so that you didn't have two but um, that raises all kinds of issues which one is the real one No, this, this is uh, a, a something new that they're talking about for, for getting medical treatments into uh, areas quickly so that you don't have to wait for Federal Express to come pick up the vial and, and transport it, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles. You can, through the Internet, beam the formula or, you know, just email the formula to the, the 3D printer on the other end and create what's needed there. So in a sense, it's not real teleportation, but in a sense it is. 
but it's the principle upon which teleportation might be developed at some point down the road. Now, in a transhuman society, I mean, what does that mean? Uh, does, it, does it mean, would you be scanned perhaps into the form of electrons and then stored in a, uh, a hard drive somewhere and just live in, a ver in the matrix? Possibly. Don't know. Yes, yes. So, yeah, there, there, are a lot, there are a lot of implications to this, but it's more than just uh, overcoming the technological problems. We, we need to address, and I guess that's the point here, the technological challenges are, are still very, very high. Um, not all researchers believe that it will be possible to create a mechanical, a computer simulation of a human brain. But before we get there, we need to address these other issues. What if we do? How do we make sure it thinks like us so that it doesn't want to destroy us? You say you have another one? Oh, okay. that was it? Okay. Okay. Uh, what's the difference between the post-humanism and the transhumanism? That's second. I mean, the difference between the post-humanism and the transhumanism. Uh, well, very simply, the transhuman is the one that's in the process of becoming a post-human. Post-human is where you are no longer recognizable as homo sapiens. Whether that means you're living as an avatar, uh, as a... Uh, a, uh, a, a an electrical pattern in a, in a computer network somewhere, or uh, a completely non-biological entity, but something other than homo sapiens. So now we are humanism, and 2045 will have transhumanism, and after that yeah. will be posts. Will be, will yes, be. There are already uh, people in this movement that are using the term cis-human to refer to us. C-I-S, cis-human. Just as back in the day there was the, uh, the cis-alpines and the trans-alpine Gaul, meaning this side of the Alps, that side of the Alps. Transhuman, cis-human. We're on this side of the singularity. On the other side, transhuman. Transhuman. Any, yes? I was going to say that, uh, like you said, like avatar, but you know, I think that, you know, every single night that we dream, we are like avatar, you know? Like last night, I was in Iran, in my dream, you know? So, and you know, I mean that if, if, we, if, if, we, can, if we can build a transhuman, we are already a transhuman, because we should hire, we should be higher than that in order to create that, you know what I mean? So this is my basic question, actually, you know? So uh, I don't know. And secondly, uh, is there any hard evidence that molarity is like related to genetics? Molarity. Mol molarity. Uh, I'm sorry. Is mor morality. Morality. Morality is yeah. related to genetics. Genetics. Yes. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. There are. Th that's a field of study that uh, I'm not expert in. Uh, there is some indication that you'll find certain genetic patterns more frequently on death row uh, in prison than, than in the general population. But there's some question as to whether that, which came first, if the genetic deviation is what led a person to commit a, a violent act or if somehow the violent act or the act of, to use an old-fashioned word, uh, sin, somehow changes... Uh, changes your, ge your genetic code. Uh, it, it is known now from uh, the, the study of epigenetics that things that we do or are exposed to can change our DNA. But as far as whether there are certain genetic components to morality, I, I don't know the answer to that. It's an interesting question, though. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is kind of like really out there, but do you believe in, um, in intelligence beyond Earth? Intelligence beyond Earth. Um, yes and no. You're talking about extraterrestrial life? Yeah, because of the fact that, you know, if we are going in this, like, I am a firm believer in, like, you know, like, the next step of human evolution is to be tied into what we create, and that is essentially technology because that's just where things are going. We're going to have to deal with the way that we are, how our Earth is dying, and be able to create intelligence or some type of super machines and things like that where we're going to have to do geoforming and stuff like that in order to live beyond you know, um, extinction. Now, let's say if we are a part of the cosmos, what's going to happen if we run into another super intelligence? You know, like... Mm -hmm. 
will this clash of intelligence be, uh, I don't know, uh, catastrophic to where we become or, or even like mingle with them? Well, Dr. Diamandis, if you watch that uh, presentation from Global Future 2045, um, it's only about 15 minutes. I only played about a one-minute clip from it, but uh, he goes into that in that 15-minute presentation. He believes that as we wake up and become a planetary meta-intelligence and we turn our collective consciousness out into the cosmos, that we will find other collective meta-intelligences out there. Then there's Dr. Daguerre's who believes that uh, what we'll find are massively intelligent machines that have been created by other societies that are out there and they might come here and try to do us harm. Um, myself, um, you know, full disclosure, I, I'm a Christian. And so I do believe that we are already in contact with a superintelligence. In fact, more than one. One supreme superintelligence and then other, I wouldn't call them uh, extraterrestrial, I'd call them interdimensional intelligences that have been uh, plaguing humanity for our entire existence. Um, so that, that's, that's where I come down on it. I mean, I, I you know, don't want to get into an apologetics here for, for the Christian faith, but that's, that's where I come down on that issue. Um, I'm in a conspiracy too, so I <clears throat> do research into that stuff. I just think you'd, you'd, you'd love my show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who really killed Kennedy? I talked to a guy who thinks, thinks he's figured it out just a couple of weeks ago. So. Well, uh, I think uh, Derek needs to be released to go to continue his packing and all the stuff to, to leave. So please wish him uh, good and uh, please give him a hearty thank you. Thank you.